It's my 15th birthday and my granddad brought me to a beach in North Queensland and gave me a present. A bracelet of a delicate white substance I'd never seen before. It's coral, he said. It came from these waters that were once the home of something called the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral reef. I hadn't heard of coral reefs. They hadn't existed in my lifetime. But only a few dozen years ago, they were all around the Earth, mainly in the oceans near the equator. Coral reefs were known as the rainforests of the sea, a haven for marine life and one of the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. But by the end of this century's first decade, they were already disappearing and dying at an alarming rate and all the species that depended on them too. Like the parrotfish that fed on chunks of coral, these fish worked together with marine worms and sponges to produce the coral sand that created beautiful white sand beaches. He told me that once you got past the millions of fishes and looked closer, the huge diversity really hit home when you saw how every inch was taken by one or another species. The secret lives of the tiny creatures were carried out in this complicated structure. There were harlequin shrimps that would keep their starfish prey alive and harvest parts from it. Sea hares would keep the algae in check and cleaner shrimps worked hard to maintain the reef's fish. The octopus would change colour and texture while stretching its tentacles around rocks in a formidable hunt. In the crowded community, there was a competition for every available space and some species had gone to extraordinary lengths to find a home. Like the clownfish, which found shelter in the stinging tentacles of sea anemones, the other fish tried desperately to avoid. But their shelter became useless as the reefs gradually started to bleach and then collapse through ocean acidification. The clownfish became confused by these changes and couldn't find their anemone hosts. Dad told me of the day when he finally caught sight of a school of shrimp fish. He kept as still as he could as he watched how they swam face down, perfectly camouflaged so they were nearly invisible. Little did he know that he would never see these amazing fish again. As I sat in the boat and looked out across the now silent sea, I tried to imagine what the reefs had been like and why people didn't try harder to save them. Stony corals owed their success as reef builders to symbiotic algae called zooxanthellae. They provided almost all of our corals' nutritional requirements. These zooxanthellae were sensitive to temperature changes. In 2008, one third of all reef building corals were at risk of extinction. By 2009, an estimated 19% of the world's coral reefs had already been lost. 
35% more were seriously threatened. This was the time to act, Grandad said. He told me that towards the end of the 20th century, there were all sorts of threats working to damage coral reefs. There were plagues of coral predators, like the crown of thorns starfish. But the reefs were also being destroyed by coastal development and deforestation, pollution from agriculture, sewage, disease, overfishing and destructive fishing practices. All of these threats were happening right in front of everyone's eyes. People knew and some tried to stop them, but not enough was done. By the end of 2009, climate changes and ocean acidification had overtaken all other impacts. Food webs in the Southern Ocean began to collapse. Then mass bleaching killed off many reefs. The changes in the chemistry of the seawater meant that the corals couldn't grow properly. In 2009, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere was at 387 parts per million. People tried to limit CO2 levels to 450 parts per million, but it was already too high to stop this destruction. The reefs died one by one and disappeared forever. The first to die was the Davies Reef in Australia, then Heron Island, the Maldives, the Belize Barrier Reef, the Grand Recife in Madagascar, and many, many more, until they were all gone. Today, in 2065, not one of them exists in a recognisable form. I've only ever known degraded and slimy piles of rubble that Grandad told me were reefs. It is almost impossible to imagine. It took 240 million years for reef-forming corals to evolve, and yet we helped destroy them in a comparative heartbeat. I stare with awe at these fragments in my hand and wish that I could have seen them still alive. But for that to have been possible, the atmospheric CO2 level had to be reduced below 350 parts per million. But we did not make that happen. Not only did the amazing corals disappear forever, but we also lost almost all of the species that depended on the reefs for their own survival. It's a crime that people didn't try harder. Millions of people depended on reef ecosystems. Those reefs had provided so many goods and services, like coastal protection and fisheries. After reefs collapsed, seagrass beds followed. mangrove forests were quickly washed away. The economic value of reefs was poorly understood then, but we now know that it ranged between $172 and $375 billion per year. In 2008, 
Almost 500 million people lived within 100 kilometers of a reef. Overexploitation resulted in the loss of many reef resources and caused widespread reef destruction. As thousands of species became scarcer or disappeared, more and more people struggled with malnutrition and lack of income. And yet, to stop it happening, we only had to do one thing. One thing only. We had to reduce the atmospheric CO2 level significantly below 350 parts per million. But we didn't. Now, 10 years after the last coral reef dissolved out of existence forever, we sit on Grandad's boat looking out over dead waters and he wishes we could invent a time machine and go back to the point when we realised something was seriously wrong. I asked him what year we would go back to. When was the turning point? Without hesitation, he says, 2010. 2010 is the year we should have sat up and taken notice. 2010 is the year we should have finally taken action to prevent this destruction, this loss of life. 2010 is the year we should have finally made a change. Could we?